Hi, everyone. And thank you very much for this lovely introduction. Really appreciate that. And thanks a lot for having me here. So the thing with Angular right now is my theory is even though the Angular framework made dramatic changes recently that in general made the learning experience much better, I think right now is probably the worst time to learn Angular. And the reason behind that, once my slide changed, OK, here we go. Angular is, has some age by now, right? The first commit is from 2014. So that's a couple of years ago. If we think about like apps that rewrote in 2014, I wouldn't touch them with a 10 feet tall right now. So obviously, the framework made some transitions. And I think that is a good thing, because last year, the Angular team announced the Angular Renaissance, which other than like great changes, introduced new logos, new marketing, new documentation, plenty of great things that in general should help the learning experience. The problem from my perspective is while the docs are updated, the code is or the framework is in a much better shape, companies are just not there yet to support that. There is still old Angular code, and I'm not talking Angular JS code, I'm talking like old Angular code, which doesn't utilize the latest and greatest standards. So um let's have a look. At that, with this talk, what I'm trying to do is basically give you a recommendation, recommendation of the tricky paths during the learning experience of Angular. And before we go into that, a couple of words about me, even though that I was already really well introduced. Thank you very much again for that. So I'm developer advocate at JetBrains, mostly involved with TypeScript and JavaScript stuff. I'm also a member of the RxS core team, Angular G GDE, and doing the Angular Plus Show podcast which you can listen on Spotify, Tidal, all, all the pod podcast platforms. Before we go into the talk, the thing that is very important here, as of now, everything that you see where you have like those different code samples and stuff is backwards compatible. That means even if you're on the latest in Angular 18, you can choose both approaches. They're completely fine. There are just some advantages to the different approaches. So I want to make this very clear. This those are not breaking changes in the sense of it. It's really just different tools that you can have different options. And the very first one, before we go super deep into that, this is pretty much how an Angular component should look like these days. And the first thing that I really appreciated is that the Angular team changed the style URLs array to just a string. because. Theoretically, there was the idea to having it compose a little bit and utilizing like different style strings and aggregating them. No one does that. I've never seen an application that actually utilized that. And I'm writing, I wrote Angular applications for the last 10 years. So I, I, I think I've seen a couple of things, but I've never seen anyone utilize that. So having that change make it more intuitive. Okay, we have one component and that has one style makes a lot of sense. And other than that, in Angular components, you have this thing of interpolation. Most frameworks utilize this in some way where you can do like basic JavaScript expressions. And it, in this case, it would render two on the screen. It's more about like the string inter or the interpolation aspect of things. The thing where things become tricky is eventually you want to add some logic to your component and not just have like fancy like styling aspect. You can just use HTML for that. And if you want to utilize logic and you go down the Angular documentation, you will, or like blog posts, you will come across two different approaches. You will either see this thing with the asterisk and ng if or ng4 or similar things, or you will read something like this where you have this add if, which kind of looks like Razor. Um, so that can be really confusing. And you don't know what is current, what is the latest and greatest, what should I use, what are the advantages. You have blog posts describing the different aspects on its own, but it's very difficult to like compare those things if you're like just approaching the framework at this point. So what we're talking about here is something called structural directives versus control flow. Everything with an asterisk in the front is called a structural directive. Everything with an add in front is called is considered part of the control flow syntax. And if we look at this from like a 10,000 feet view because if you're approaching the framework you don't want to learn you don't want to you don't need the nitty gritty details what you need is a high level overview that so that you can start writing an application and be like uh, make your own path make your own learning path in the end 
So a structure directive is some kind of logic that in the end affects how the template is rendered, right? An ng if, in the case, if the condition is true, will render a certain part. If the condition is false, won't render that part. So that means that rendering is influenced by that directive. On the technical level, structure directives are just a special kind of directives, which also means that you can write your own structure directives, which is a nice feature that you can utilize if you're writing more advanced Angular code. And it was originally introduced in Angular 2. And is, as I said earlier, it's still compatible. You can still use it to this day. With control flow syntax, it's a little bit different. Fundamentally, it's still the same thing. It's logic that affects the structure of the template. It does utilize some compiler magic, how to involve or how to render the template. So it's a little bit more magical, and which also means you cannot write your own control flow syntax blocks. You cannot write your own logic to that. You're stuck, stuck in that sense with what the Angular framework provides. It is a fairly recent feature. It was introduced with Angular 17. So if you're still on an older version of Angular or working for a company that utilizes Angular before version 17, you're out of luck here. In general, I have to say, though, the API feels a lot nicer and more ergonomic in that sense. It's easier to read, easier to dis to comprehend. If you're looking at a block of HTML, you can easily identify, OK, here's the if, here's the else. It lines up very nicely how you're used to it. So that's from a readability aspect, I definitely prefer the control flow approach. Let's look at some pros and cons of both of those things. The thing with structured directives, realistically, most applications out there are not on Angular 17 or higher. A lot of Angular applications are actually still on Angular 9, which is a problem on its own. But if you're learning because, or if you're learning Angular because you want to, to land your first developer job, it's very likely that you won't see control flow syntax in your day-to-day -day job. There is the benefit with that they can be customized and you can do your own structured directives, which is definitely more of an advanced feature and not as commonly used as you would think. Another benefit that is very surprising for me is if you understand structured directives, the control flow syntax is very intuitive. Like there will be hardly any questions for you. Everything will be just, oh, everything that used to be an asterisk and an ng if is now an add if. It's it's pretty intuitive. The jump this way is a lot easier. Having that said, control flow syntax itself is a lot more intuitive it, by a lamp mile. Um, there are even some performance benefits and also some more meaningful defaults um, that you will look at, we will learn. There are also some features that you can do with control flow that you cannot do with structured directives. And here we're talking about the add defer block, which will lazy load single parts of your template, which is a nice feature in particular in bigger Angular applications can be heavily utilized to improve performance and things. So there are definitely some handy benefits here. My recommendation, though, would be I would suggest you learn the basics of structured directives. Um, it will be a little bit of a steeper learning curve, but not too dramatically. And moving from control to control flow syntax, if your Angular application has already control flow, you're, you're good to go. Like the, the jump is very easy in that direct, in direction. I, I, I have several of those sections where I talk about the different features and the different categories. I want you to be able after this talk to look into more detail. So for every one of those sections, I will provide resources that you can check out depending on what path you choose, what you want to learn. Um, I don't go over those in detail, so I'll just skip those. OK, we got this control flow structure directive things figured out, but there's still a lot more. And it, you feel like you mastered your first hurdle, and you'll be like, OK, I got structure directives now. And you go to control flow, and everything seems fine. And then you get into the next thing, modules versus standalone components. The, the thing with modules, you either love them or you absolutely hate them. There's hardly any in between with those things. But let's look, before we go super into that, let's have a quick look. An ng module 
is if you're coming from like another programming language, very fairly comparable to a package. That's at least the idea. So within that package, you can describe what is available and you can define boundaries within that package and outside of this package. What can other packages that utilize this package access and whatnot? So it is from a separation of concerns perspective, it can be a very powerful tool allowing for encapsul encapsulation. Um, the, it gets a little bit tricky when we talk about submodules and how they interact with how, and then you have lazy loaded modules and all those shenanigans. So it's definitely a very convoluted thing and not necessarily very intuitive because you have also ES modules that have absolutely nothing to do with an NG module. So you have those, it's definitely confusing. It's one of the most confusing parts when you learned Angular at before version 16, I think, or 14, 15, when standalone was introduced. Very difficult to comprehend in that sense, how it's different, why do I need to do this? And it does lead to very bad code sometimes where you just have one big module, and then you also don't have all the benefits that I listed with encapsulation stuff. Things get particularly tricky about providers, but I don't want to go super in detail here. Just like a heads up if you decide, hey, I need to learn modules because my current application utilizes modules. Providers is definitely the tricky part of modules. So summarizing that, engine modules can be very confusing. Engine modules can be extremely complex if you don't have like an architect overseeing this. And there is the benefit that they can utilize an organizational purpose. You can define structure, you can define boundaries. And within those boundaries, you can even define responsibilities in the sense of that part of the team is responsible for this module, that part of the team is responsible for that module, which is a nice organizational approach. Let's look at standalone. And if you come from any other framework, literally any other framework, this will feel a lot more intuitive to you other than that you have to declare the standalone pro uh, property here. So let's look at that. So a standalone component is basically a module on its own, if you think about it that way. So you still define what part you can import, what part you can access in the template, what the providers are and all those parts. Um, and you can even use child components by just importing them. So it, it feels a lot more intuitive. Particular, uh, some of those aspects an IDE can help you with. Just I've heard of some that can do that. Um, the thing for providers, if you want to utilize them, you can import them and they will be, uh, you can provide them within the component and they will be available for every subcomponent, which logically makes very a lot of sense. I, I can just repeat myself on that aspect because standalone components are definitely more intuitive. It is how pretty much every other framework behaves. And they're also light, more lightweight. I think, um, if I remember it correctly, um, Ionic uh, and Mike Hartington announced when the Ionic framework switched to standalone just because they didn't need to import as much anymore, their Angular or the starter Ionic app became much smaller. Uh, so there are some benefits with that, and you need to learn a whole lot less. The thing with modules, though, is they are still heavily in use. For eight years, there were applications written with modules and with the concept of modules in mind. They, there's no way that um, companies will switch right away to standalone components. It's a fairly heavy migration that you would need to do. There are tools that support you with that, with schematics, but in general, it's a big jump to say, okay, we're stopping modules now, we do standalone components. The thing is, standalone is way easier, way easier. And there, if I would start with a Greenfield project right now, I would say, hey, now Nicholas, here's this new fancy business use case, and we need you to write an Angular application for that. I would definitely go with standalone. There's no discussion. There are, if you are on the version that supports standalone, you can even mix and match 
which is probably a nice way to start a migration in this transition. But honestly, there, you do need to learn about modules at this point. There's no way that every business application, every project that you will see already uses standalone components. The benefits that it's easier is not benefit enough for companies to say, I switch now to modules, uh, to standalone. So as of right now, 2024, my recommendation for you would be learn about modules. But if you are in a situation where you can write new parts of your Angular application and you are already on the right version of Angular, use standalone components for those. But to understand how current projects function, you will have to learn modules. I really, I really, really hope that I need to change the slide in the future and I can just say, hey, modules is this old thing. You don't need to learn about it. Basically, no one uses it anymore. And you can just go with standalone. Right now, this is not the case. I did say it before, though. The thing is, if you start from scratch, I wouldn't bother with modules because they are complex. It's a learning barrier. Just go with standalone in that case. And I would even use that for new parts of an application if it makes sense. Same as before, here are some resources that you can use to learn and understand how modules work, and the same here for how standalone components work. Probably my favorite topic on this whole presentation is the difference now with signals and observables. Every framework in 2023, 2024 pretty much had to introduce signals in one way or another. And it's it's a great tool for fine-grained creativity. Observables have just been around for like 12 something years. Um, let's look at this a little bit because it's definitely, even within Angular experts, still a point of confusion. When do I need what? What? Why do I need both? But let's look into it. The thing with signals, okay. Sorry, my slide transitions were kind of weird. The thing with signals is they are stateful by default, so they always have one value available. Um, you can Every time you access a signal, you will get one value. There's no way around it. And a signal, in general, is synchronous. Those are the important characteristics that you need to understand. For an observable, it's pretty much the exact opposite for all those things. Uh, an observer by default is stateless. There are some operators and some ways to make it stateful, but by default, it's stateless. An observable, and that is probably the point of confusion for a lot of people in how observables work and how I interact with an observable, has zero or potentially zero values to an infinite amount of values. And the other nice thing that can be nice for certain use cases is an observable is either synchronous or asynchronous. Ideally, though, if you work with the observable in the right approach, you shouldn't care. But that's part of a different talk. When would I use what? I would use signals for everything that is rendered. Everything that is somewhere in the template at the end, I would use a signal, even if the source is an observable and I just convert it to a signal. It does allow for more performant rendering. There are, in terms of performance, there are still some improvements made that will really give it the edge in the long run. But in general, if you want to render a certain value, I would use a signal for that. I wouldn't use an observable for that anymore. Doesn't mean, as I said, that I would convert a an observable to a signal. But for the observables, observables have always, I think one of the first sentences in the RxJS docs is, observables are great for asynchronous aggregation. They are fantastic for event coordination. Either be it like different user workflows, like drag and drop or those kind of things, or aggregation of different asynchronous operations, like you need to load first this request, then this, maybe if that fails, you need to load another things. For those kind of scenarios, RxJS is Fantastic. It also has this handy thing that it supports cancellation really well um, and has a very nice API around that, less than a board controller, but again, part of a different talk. And if you have something asynchronous, 
use an observer for that. You can, with effects, you can somehow shoehorn asynchronous operations into a signal. Don't do that. It's cumbersome, fragile, and observables are much better for those use cases. So everything that is asynchronous, I would immediately be like, use observables. I, I cannot stress this asynchronous part enough because there are approaches of like, hey, can we not have like an HTTP client that perhaps that works with Signal? Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. For signals, you should always ask, does it make sense to ask for a current value? For a lot of things, that it does make sense to at any point ask for a current value. If we talk about forms, if we talk about values that we want to render, if we talk about asynchronous state that we load from a server, it doesn't make sense to say, hey, I want the current state of that. So everything asynchronous, definitely observables. So here's my recommendation. And I say this as an RHS core team member. I would, if I start learning Angular right now, I would, for the first time, completely ignore the fact that RHS is even in the package JSON. RHS is by no way an easy library to comprehend. And you can write pretty complex Angular applications just with signals. For a lot of those basic CRUD applications, like writer to do applications, you don't need RxJS. So your learning experience with just starting with Signal will be much smoother. Having that said, there's no way around RxJS. If you write meaningful business applications, you will have to perform asynchronous operations. You will have to do event aggregation. You will have to learn observables or some kind of asynchronous pattern. You can also dig deep into promises if you really want to, but my recommendation would be observables. I am slightly biased here, though. So I want to share a couple of resources with you here again and for signals and observables. Very valuable. I would highly recommend you checking those out. The last thing that I want to talk about for a feature that was introduced somewhat recently, but definitely impacts how you write Angular code is the constructor injection for dependency injection versus the inject function. And I hope I don't go over or like too deep because that is a topic that I feel somewhat passionate about too. The thing with how constructor injection works in Angular, right? You have some component and in the constructor, you say, hey, I need the HTTP client or some other dependency and you just declare it there, and Angular as a framework will automatically say, oh, you're asking for HTTP client. I have an HTTP client instance here. Here you go. And we'll basically provide it for you automatically. Very nice feature, allows for nice testing scenarios and stuff like that. The inject function works a little bit different where you, instead of declaring it in the constructor, you're in, you're defining a function or you're calling a function that the Angular framework provides, inject, and you specify the dependency that you want, in our case, HTTP client. Those two codes work exactly the same from an application developer perspective. It's just a different approach how you structure it. The thing with constructor injection is it's pretty intuitive. Like most Angular or people that learned Angular in the past 10 years, that was not a struggle for them. And inject the injection function definitely has some pitfalls that you need to be aware of depending on how you use it. Um, so let's look into that a little bit more. The nice thing with the inject function is because of the functions, you can create high order functions that provide convenience for you in the way you're using this utility. So for instance, what we can do is we can create a load function that gets some data from somewhere and we're calling this on click. Well, we cannot really do this because you will get an error that somewhat looks like this where it says, hey, the inject function needs to be called in an injection context. And out of nowhere, you now have to learn about what an injection context is. It does specify this here fairly well with saying you can either use a constructor, a factory function, or a field initializer. But if you're like starting from scratch, those will be somewhat intimidating. So what you would have to do instead is there's a utility called run in context, which will automatically get the injection context and takes care of that for you. Not intuitive and might lead to some unnecessary bugs that you run into at runtime. So definitely a pitfall you should be aware of when working with the inject function. 
I do have to say, though, this capability of providing or declaring functions that automatically take stuff of you, or provide more reusable pieces that you can still inject and therefore have like all the testing benefits of dependency injection is very, very cool for like allowing for really powerful patterns. So for instance, something that I did here as an example is I performed the HTTP call already, take care of like, or like generalizing error handling, take care of subscription cleanup and all those things. The inject function capsules this logic really, really nicely and therefore allows you for more reusable code. And you could even drive this a notch further with something like this, but because we're somewhat running out of time, I'll just skip over that. Yes, here's my recommendation. And it's probably mostly personal, but I think the inject function is really, really cool for the patterns that it allows you. It allows for more reusable code. It also, some there are some cases where you have like an endless huge constructor just for dependency injection. This feels a little bit more readable to me. I do have to say in the end, at the end of the day, this is mostly a personal preference. So either way, agree with your team on what you're doing. If you understand the inject function, you will automatically understand how constructor injection works. So this direction is much easier than the other way around. So my personal preference is leaning towards the inject function. But at the end of the day, the constructor function, you can test a little bit easier because you could just call that class or like instantiate it with new and provide the dependencies yourself. So there are, there are some small benefits, but those are really, really subtle from my perspective. And therefore, for I personally am a fan of creating like utility like small powerful function and for this thing the inject function is just game changer again a couple of resources that i can recommend you checking out great videos and stuff um again also for the inject function and that is the content of my talk really appreciate every one of you coming by and learning a little bit about angular i hope this helps you with how to approach angular and what to focus on. I, I do want the last closing notes that I want you to take with you is start with the Angular docs though. They they focus on the latest and greatest. And now that you know those difference, what you need to understand, the Angular docs will be a great starting point for starting from scratch, taking you somewhere, and then you make a couple left and right turns depending on what you want to focus on. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the talk. I love the fact that you're running late. Uh, shows the fact that you're passionate about it. So that's uh, very nice. And you have Hi. also an amazing background like Lee Robinson. So that's uh, that's very nice. Uh, your background is stunning. Thanks. It's not uh, it's not done yet. But uh, anyway, let's go to the questions because we have a yes. lot from the audience. And um, I want to cover um, as much as possible. So do you have any tips for migrating to signals? Yes, so I do have a talk that I did at ngconf. The videos are already online. The talk itself went terribly, so focus more on the slides instead of what I what I was talking about. Is it live coding session? It was terrible, yeah. Okay, it happens. <laughs> so uh, tips for migrating to signals. I, I migrate to signals on a three-step approach. Um, the first step is just instead of um, using observables and the async pipe just in the component call to signal and call the function instead of the async pipe. That is already a great first approach because this way you make very clear from here on I use signals and everything behind that is observables. The second approach would be to also check your state management layer. And that is usually in a service. So I would start if you're really about like, if you have stateful services where you usually have like behavior subjects or something similar, I would yeah. start changing that to signals. That is a little bit of a bigger uh, refactoring. So I I would see if there's a value for that. If you have like complex RxJS logic, it might make sense because you can probably make things easier with signals. Um, and then the last step, I'm a big, big fan of um, NGX signal store. We will also talk about that on Friday in the Forge day, this exercise thing. Uh, the Forge, uh, question, yes. Yes. Um, so there we will utilize NGX signal store to, um, do state management 
with like an organized approach with Angular. So picking a state management library that utilizes signals would be my third step. I usually, for state management library, that is like my last approach if I have really complex state. So therefore, that's my last step. But Signal Store has this nice implementation where it's, it feels like a state management and takes care of really nice things without forcing you to be like too restrictive with your code. So I'm a big fan of it. Nice. But yeah. other state management library have Signal implementation by now too. So that's okay. mostly person preference. It's nice. We're going to have a lot of people for the Forge part. Next session. Um, what I know, Angular 18 reduced use of declarators and is zoneless. So do you prefer 18, 17, 16 or lower versions and why? Um, I would, if I'm a big company, I would probably try to be one version behind of the latest Angular, just for like stability and making sure you can, you get like into the rhythm of like Angular migrations. The jumps between 16, 17 and 18 are pretty seamlessly, particularly if you don't use Angular material, that's a different thing. Um, I, my personal preference, I hate decorators. I think they should have never been used. Uh, so I'm a very big fan of the approach that the Angular uh, team took of making component or uh, decorators more optional with the new APIs, which mostly boils down to like having proper type safety because decorators are not type safe. Um, but yes, definitely. Um, very excited for zoneless. I zone, if we talk about zoneless, I think every application will benefit from zoneless. Most applications won't benefit enough that it really matters for zoneless uh, in terms of rendering performance, uh, because Angular's rendering performance has always been good enough for most business application. If you really have like a pl pl plenty of elements that you render or you have really like critical parts, making those zoneless will be really nice. The performance improvements is, are, are huge from what I've seen so far. Um, yeah, I, I I would be super excited for a decorator less or an Angular without decorators, but we'll probably not get there. But yeah, we're going in a good okay, direction. It's, it's maybe a bit intense, yeah. Um, so that covers also this question of like uh, as a first timer, so I'm going to probably skip this. We have this one of like, what naming conventions do you use? <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> so if you look into the history of the uh, dollar notation, it boils down mostly to a joke to annoy one of the former RxJS core team members. Um, and with TypeScript, the IDE tells you that you have an observable. So it doesn't really matter. I'm not a big fan of the dollar notation for observables. So I wouldn't do any notation. I, I don't use I for interfaces in TypeScript. I'm not a big fan of those kind of conventions. I rather have TypeScript telling me this is a type and shameless plug here, but WebStorm does special color highlighting for signals. I rather prefer approaches like that where the IDE tells you things instead of like you having to force certain conventions. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, just use the tools rather than uh, trying to do something on, on your side. Yep. Hey. Yeah, I got small cats, apparently. Uh, should that we convert a... our API responses into signals if we are fetching data to be displayed? If you realistically, at some point, you're going to render those uh, or that data. That's why you're fetching it, because you want to display it. So if you're rendering it, yes, 100%. There is this a little bit of this fine grain or like this, where do you draw the line between like what is an observable and what is a signal? Um, so, so to give you a feeling of that, I would start really at like the component level and draw that boundary at first there. That makes it very easy, which means the service would return the observable as with the data, and then in the component you convert it to a signal. This way also allows for like a little bit more composa composability if you want to like do more stuff with that. Like, let's say you want to fetch a J or you do a data uh, request login, you get the JWT, and then you want to take that JWT to get other data. That would be much easier if that data is available already in an observable instead of a signal. So it's it's definitely a tricky thing. And my biggest recommendation would be play around with it a little bit and make find like your good approach to that. My approach would be draw the line at the component at the beginning. OK, perfect. Um, technical one? Should we replace behavior subjects yes, with signal? Yes, 100%. 100%. They are very similar. <laughs> yes. Um, could you give some example? I mean, this is maybe more visual. So I, uh, um, maybe if you come back during the 
forward session. That will be nice. Yeah, uh, and in my know. slides, so if you uh, scan the QR code, the part that I skipped is an yeah. example of that inject function. That way they, they can check the, the actual code. Yep. Perfect. Uh, last one. What if you provide in root instead of constructor injection? I'm not sure. The, those are mean. basically complementary. You okay. need to provide something in root or the component to be able to use constructor injection. So uh, provide. Honestly, like at the very beginning, I would probably just start with providing everything in root. It's good enough. Later on, you will notice, oh, okay, I can reuse some parts, and then you start providing it in the component. But that's already more of an advanced Angular technique, I would yeah. say. In the start, just provide it in the root, and you're good. Perfect. Um, yeah, so that was a lot of questions. Uh, so we apparently have a lot of people interested into the topic, so that's very nice. Um, Sweet. So thanks for your... Uh, for your amazing talk, thanks for your presence. And um, people can find you on the socials if they have any more questions. Yes. And I uh, wish you an amazing day, Jan. Yeah. yeah, same to you. Good luck for the rest of the day. Bye.